We're getting ready for the uh, final episode of the History of Political Philosophy with Dr. David Gordon. Uh, but before we finish here today, I'd like to introduce to you the founder of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, President Lou Rockwell. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> before we get started, I just want to thank the two generous donors who made this conference possible this week, uh, Mr. Steve Berger and Mr. Ken Garshina. Um, these are two of the uh, um, of a, of a uh, small but uh, very effective group, the Austrian hedge fund managers, uh, both, both stars on Wall Street. Uh, Ken came to us because he'd been a, a student of Walter Bloch's at uh, Holy Cross College, uh, Steve Berger because of his readings in, in Austrian economics, and uh, we thank them very much for uh, making this Gordon seminar possible. And I want to take this opportunity to uh, present to David. David, if you want to come up here. Each year, the Mises Institute presents the Murray and Rothbard Medal of Freedom. And uh, David is the recipient this year. Um, this was established by Mr. George W. Connell. Um, George was a civil engineer, graduate of Purdue, who worked all over the world, uh, in Libya, in Saudi Arabia, in California, in Texas, uh, in England. Um, and had a great devotion to the principles of freedom and shortly before his death in 2004 he asked us to establish an annual Rothbard Prize to be given to a scholar or a public intellectual uh, for a lifetime of achievement uh, for the ideals of liberty and the tradition of, of Murray Rothbard. And uh, we're very delighted to give this to David this year. Uh, it's a beautiful medal with Murray's uh, picture on it. It also includes a $20 gold piece from the days when the American government hadn't been entirely corrupted. And uh, of course, David could tell many stories about David. Uh, people who've been at this seminar or watched it on the internet already know that there can't be too many people who could give 10 lectures of this sort without a note. Um, when I had the, the privilege of going through Murray Rothbard's office in Las Vegas after his death, uh, one of the letters I came upon, uh, upon was a, from the mid-1970s. Murray had been to a Liberty Fund conference, and he was writing someone about it, and I talked a little bit about the conference, but he said the most extraordinary and wonderful thing that had happened to him at the conference was that he met the closest thing to a universal genius uh, that he'd ever met in his life, and it was this young man, David Gordon. And, of course, they became very close. Um, I always think that, um, even aside from, from David's intellectual achievements, when I would see the two of them together, especially when I'd see Murray's face after seeing David uh, and not having seen him for a while, that it was really the look of a father upon a son. Uh, I think David was in many ways uh, Murray's son uh, as well as his, uh, his intellectual collaborator and heir. And uh, just, you know, the, one, of the most, one of the many things David has done, this most wonderful uh, essential, essential Rothbard. And David, of course, has much else to do. Uh, he's done much, and David, it's a uh, great honor to present you this medal. Come on up here. Thank you very much. Do you want me to keep these for you in the back? Oh, yes. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Lou. I'm very grateful to you and the Mises Institute for your support over the years and for this uh, great honor. It was a complete surprise to me. In fact, I'm so surprised I won't be able to give the final lecture. Uh, 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 I'm going to talk today about uh, Robert Nozick and uh, Murray Rothbard. Uh, Robert Nozick uh, lived from 1938 to 2002. Uh, he uh, graduated from Columbia and then attended uh, Princeton uh, his main uh, teachers in philosophy department were uh, Carl Hempel, the philosopher of science, uh, Hilary Putnam, who was then at, at Princeton, also a also philosopher of science, and the uh, specialist in Greek philosophy, Gregory Vlastov. Uh, since it's the last lecture, I'll you'll allow me to tell one story that he knows it told me. Uh, when he was in the class of Hilary Putnam, uh, Putnam had on the final exam, one of the questions was, write your own question and answer it. So Nozick's question was, write your own question and answer it. 
And the answer was, write your own question and answer it. Uh, after, uh, after uh, he graduated from Princeton, he studied at Oxford for a while, and then he uh, was given a, uh, he, he became professor at Harvard, where he taught, uh, I think, from the mid-1960s, uh, with uh, one a couple years interruption at, where it was at Rockefeller University down to his death. And he got, uh, I think he was the, at the time, uh, one of the youngest persons ever to be get tenure at Harvard. Uh, I think he got it around age 30. Uh, he was, Nozick was uh, extraordinarily fast in argument. His specialty was counter-arguments. Any, any position that one came up with, he could immediately demolish. In fact, uh, Thomas Nagel, who was uh, a friend, a very close friend of Nozick's uh, for a long time till he wrote a review of Anarchy, State, and Utopia that offended Nozick, uh, said about him, it was in, in the eulogy he wrote, uh, he gave at Nozick's funeral, he said, uh, Nozick could destroy any position he himself came up with, so he knew when he would write something, he would have to stop uh, giving arguments at some point because he knew he couldn't come up with anything that he himself would be unable to demolish. Uh, now, there in the, he wrote uh, not only on political philosophy in uh, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, but he had a very wide range of interests. He wrote uh, philosophical explanations in uh, which came out in 1981, and uh, other, he wrote other works, uh, exa The Examined Life and uh, Nature of Rationality, and then his last book was Invariances. And he, he also has, a, there's a collection of his uh, essays called Socratic Puzzle. Uh, uh, I'm going to be confining my remarks entirely to his most famous work in uh, political philosophy, uh, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. Uh, after he wrote the book, which is his uh, libertarian work, he, he, for a while, abandoned libertarianism. The most anti-libertarian remarks he made are in the book, The Examined Life, but toward the end of his life, he, would, he came back to a somewhat libertarian position. He told me that uh, his own position was he felt he was fairly close to high exposition. He didn't think he had deviated. He said, if you consider that a libertarian view, then he thought he qualified as libertarian. He said, well, people usually are willing to classify Hayek as libertarian, at least in the classical liberal tradition. So he didn't think that the fact that he had one time held a more radical view should disqualify him from being called a libertarian. Now, there are a whole lot of things, uh, topics one could talk about in Anarchy, State, and Utopia, but I just want to, I'll just mention a, a few things. Uh, first, I want to say something about uh, his classification of theories of distribution and the, uh, the famous Wilt Chamberlain example that uh, arises out of that classification. Because uh, the reason I want to say something about this is that uh, people confuse very often. He, he sometimes talks about end state uh, principles of distribution, sometimes pattern principles, and people sometimes uh, get a bit confused about uh, what he meant by the, this. I mean, I, I must say I'm one of those who sometimes gets confused by it, so I hope I've got it right. Uh, well, Nozick first distinguished two kinds of theories of distribution, theories that say how, uh, say, wealth or various other, any other good should be distributed. Uh, one is one uh, a view in which the only thing that matters is a certain structure of the distribution. I mean, supposing we have, let's say, there are five people and we want, say, uh, a particular, let's say, a single good with five people, and we have the good distributed this way. Uh, 
So we have uh, three people get one unit, two people get two, two units of the good. Now, on this kind of U, which is an, he calls uh, an end state view, all that matters is that you have this distribution. It doesn't, of course, have to be this particular one. But all that matters is structure, uh, a certain structure of the distribution is instantiated. So it doesn't matter who the people are in the distribution. As long as you have arranged this way, then the principle is satisfied. And you can have current time slice. This is under this. You'd have current time slice where what matters is what the situation is, say, at the present, at the pre present moment. You say, well, you want the distribution to be this way now. So uh, then you could have variations of other end states that aren't current time slice that would depend, say, you want a certain pattern to be, I have a certain arrangement to be realized in the future. Uh, we can see the diff, uh, see, to get an example of this, uh, uh, suppose you take, which is not, this would not be an end state theory, suppose you take a, uh, you, you, accept the, uh, you accept the Marxist view, which I'll, I'll later be talking about in those reasons for rejection. Uh, the Marxists say that uh, workers are exploited under capitalism. So suppose somebody was like this end state view and he said, well, let's say uh, this under capitalism, this is the actual, this turns out to be the actual distribution, say the workers are these first three axes, you have two capitalists, so they get twice as much. And this comes about because the workers are exploited. Uh, a, a Marxist, uh, someone who, who thought that was a bad thing, wouldn't be satisfied if the support of the end state theory said, well, look, since these workers are getting exploited, all that we're saying is that these uh, these people are getting more rather than these people. But in your view, it would be just the same pattern with other people in the, in the better position, but it would be the same, it would be the same arrangement. So the Marxists would say, you know, it matters which people are in which positions. But the one in the end state theory would say, no, all that counts is a particular arrangement is all that's required for the correct distribution. So you have these are end state theories. Now these are opposed to historical theories. Now in historical theory, the distribution doesn't just depend on this particular arrangement. It depends how you got to the, his, the, the particular arrangement that, uh, that you're holding is just. So say uh, in libertarian theory, one that uh, any libertarian would hold, uh, knows himself would hold, say an, uh, the, your uh, just arrangement is one, say, that, that depends on who owned, who is the legitimate owner of a proper property, and that depends on how the property was acquired in the past by particular people. So you see, in the... Uh, in the historical theory, it's not just a matter of particular state of affairs at one time. It depends on what's happened in the, in the, in the past. Now, here's where the part that I think people get confused. Within hist the historical theory, there are two kinds of historical theory. One is patterned, and the other is non-patterned. So the confusion is uh, that people think that the pattern is the same as the end state. But remember, the end state is a non-historical view. Patterned and non-patterned are variants of the historical view. Now, the patterned view would say what the correct distribution now is depends on some, uh, some, uh, some fact, some dimension, natural dimension, of p 
peop of people in, uh, at a particular time in the past. For example, uh, suppose somebody said uh, income, inc wealth or income should be distributed according to how much people in the past have benefited consumers. Then that's a particular dimension, how much in the past people benefited consumers. That determines the present distribution. So by knowing certain information, certain characteristics of people in the past, we can then determine the present distribution. Now a non, so an example, there are all sorts of examples. I suppose you say uh, uh, everyone should get, uh, should get uh, equal, in, should get equal incomes that are, should, people should always uh, get equal incomes, then you would look at uh, what the distribution in the past was, you know, then you correct that to get equality. So the current distribution would depend on what was the case in the past in that way. But that you could also have non-pattern principles, uh, uh, Rawls's view would be a pattern principle because it says the inequality should be to the advantage of the least well off. So if you have any, you would say at a particular time, you'd say, what are the, how, what are the uh, distribution? Then you say, are these any inequalities to the advantage of the least well off? If they're not, then you change matters so they become, uh, so that it fits this principle. But you could also have, say in the, theory that Nozick favors non-pattern principle because it just says if you're the legitimate owner of something you can pass it on to anyone you, wa you want or exchange it with anybody you want. So there isn't any way of taking the distribution at one time and then saying well there's some characteristic of that distribution which enables us to sort of map onto that and get the new distribution. Now you might be able to say sort of uh, come up with some tricky way of fitting the non-pattern view and say you could come up with some, pa uh, say that there's really a pattern there and somehow, but it, is, it isn't really the same as a pattern because it's just saying whatever happens, uh, uh, anything the just owners come up with is all right. You could rig up some sort of pattern just when you see what they do, but you couldn't in advance come up with some sort of way of going from what the libertarian owners do uh, in, to get to what, they, what the distribution should be in some future time. You just have to say whatever they come up with is all right. I think we can see what a non-pattern view, I haven't explained it to you all, but you can see more if we look at the famous Wilt Chamberlain example. Uh, and what Nozick imagines is, is, well, let's start off with some sort of a distribution, say, that some supporter of uh, egalitarianism favors. So let's suppose we start off, we say everyone has an equal income. Then he says, well, uh, each person has been assigned a certain amount of money. So he says, supposing Wilt Chamberlain, who, for those of you who are too young to remember, he was a famous uh, basketball player. Uh, suppose he, he says he'll play basketball and he sets up a game and he charges people 25 cents admission to see him play basketball. And it turns out everybody else is interested in seeing him play. So it turns out because, uh, of that, he, he, he gets $250,000, which would be much more than anybody else gets. In those days, he, when he wrote in 1974, that was an enormous salary. I imagine it still would be if you adjusted for inflation. Uh, I take it even if you don't adjust for inflation. But, uh, all right, so Nozick says, well, how, could uh, the egalitarian object to this? He would say, you start off with everybody having equal amount. You've given everybody his proper share. Everybody has just given up a quarter of his own money. And the result is a situation where Wilt Chamberlain now has $250,000. So 
the supporter of the pattern principle would say, well, we then have to take the money away from Chamberlain and redistribute it so everybody has an equal amount of money. But then Nozick said, well, look, then you're saying that a person can't even spend 25 cents of money that you yourself say is his legitimate share as he wants, because everybody, remember in the example, is voluntarily paid 25 cents to uh, see Chamberlain play basketball. So he's saying, if you want to maintain a pattern, if you want some sort of di a distribution of this kind where what people get depends on some natural dimension of uh, what they got at some point in the past, you, you say, uh, they should be all equal, so you then say, well, what are the deviations from that? So you're now having to correct that. He says that will require constant interferences with liberty. So his point, which is, applies very much to Rawls's theory, is that uh, pattern theories of justice, pattern theories of distribution are very hard to maintain. And I think this is a very important insight. I want to turn now to another topic in anarchy state utopia, the famous first part, where, as you know, in uh, libertarian theory, there are two uh, views among libertarians. Some say a minimal state, sort of so-called night watchman state, is justifiable, and then others, such as Murray Rothbard, say no, uh, even protection and justice should be provided by competing agencies on the free market. So Nozick was the foremost defender of the minimal state view. In, uh, I want to say uh, something about his arguments for, for that in the first part of, of the book. Uh, this is, uh, unfortunately, uh, his argument, in, to get his argument, it involves saying a little bit about the, his chapter on risk, which is the most difficult chapter in the whole book. This is, um, uh, uh, it's really, as I mentioned, he had a labyrinthine mind, and this is the most labyrinthine of all the chapters in the book. He's not one, uh, a writer who just set out his argument very clearly. He'll say something and then you'll, you have to look at, eat, uh, say, uh, one sentence that he said somewhere else and try to figure out how he's fit, it, fit things all in. Of course, the days when one could call him up and ask him <laughs> were m was much easier to handle matters then, but sadly, that's, uh, uh, one can't do that anymore. Uh, all right, Nozick argument against the anarchists was this. He said, well, he wanted, let's start with the situation that libertarian anarchists support, where we start off with each person has libertarian natural rights, and he can, he's free to protect himself and uh, protect other people. He can, if there are violations of rights, he can punish rights violators or hire people to do that. Uh, uh, so just as libertarian anarchists want. So what he wants to do is say, well, from this starting point, he can show by a series of steps that you can derive a minimal state. Of a, uh, uh, by a state, he, has, he means uh, an agency that will, uh, that it has in, uh, a de facto or a monopoly or close to monopoly on the use of force in the society. Say you would have, just like the state, uh, the United States, the government is the final arbiter of how force is used in the United States, in, in the country. Uh, there may be circumstances in which the state will allow private people to exercise force in themselves, but the state claims the right to supervise anyone else's use of force, plus a state will provide protective services if necessary without cost to everybody. 
we won't have a situation, say, in a situation, say, where everybody bought protective services, even if it was, say, everybody favored the same agency, all brought, bought protection from that agency, that wouldn't be a state on knows it's construed because it would just be uh, something like everybody's buying from one firm. Say, just as it turns out everybody buys his car from a single firm, everybody likes the cars that this firm puts out, that wouldn't mean convert the car agency into a, a socialist firm. It would still be a private firm, but it would just be everybody buys from, from that firm. So if you had was just one protection agency, but, every, where, but everybody bought that, voluntarily bought the protection from that, that wouldn't be a, a Nozickian state. So Nozick thinks he can show that a minimal state will arise from the starting point by a series of steps, each of which, none of which violates libertarian rights. Uh, now this, this isn't enough, because you could imagine, let's say uh, each of you voluntarily gives me all your money, you all decide you like my lectures or you want me to hurry up and finish, so to get me to do this, you give me all your money. That's, a, I think, a very good idea, but it's probably not, from your point of view, a good thing to do. So you wouldn't be violating any of your rights or anybody else's rights if you did that, but there'd be no reason to do it. So it isn't enough for Nozick to say there's a series of steps that uh, everybody can take that don't violate anybody's rights. It will result in a minimal state from a state of, sorry, from a state of libertarian anarchy. He has to show that each step will be to the advantage of people to take in that state. The, the, there's a complication in the final step that I'll uh, get to. So he, when I reach that point, but he claims he can do that. He can show, starting from libertarian anarchy, he can show how to get to the state. Uh, and what he imagines is, he says, well, we will start off with people who form protection agencies, just, as I say, just the way Murray Rothbard favors, just the way any libertarian anarchist would. I, I should mention that he says in the preface to Anarchy, State, and Utopia, it was a long conversation with Murray Rothbard that got him interested in individualist anarchism. So you could take part one of the book to be, in effect, an explanation why I am not a Rothbardian, that's what Nozick is doing there. So you have then your competing private protection agencies. Now Nozick assumes that, say, supposing one agency gets more customers, he assumes that agencies will generally be stronger the more customers they get. So once you get say there's some sort of imbalance, some agency has significantly more customers than another, people will tend to shift from the other agencies to that one because you want to be in an agency that, if there's any disputes, will win the disputes. Nozick's imagining that if, say, two agencies come into conflict and they can't settle the dispute, then they, it's legitimate, the, legitimate for them to fight to fight it out, so he thinks you'll come up with eventually one dominant agency, the dominant protection agency. But this isn't a state because it doesn't meet his criteria for state because, first of all, uh, there's still people could still be in other agencies. It isn't telling the other agencies you can't defend people, try to attract clients or compete with us. It will win disputes if, it's, if other agencies choose to fight with it, but that doesn't stop these other agencies from existing. Uh, also, uh, it isn't providing protective services to anyone, uh, if necessary, without cost. It's just 
providing services to people who uh, agree to pay for its services. So what knows it is going to go on is to say he, he can show from that situation where you have a dominant agency, the dominant agency will be able to turn itself into a, 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 a minimal state and it will do so in a way that not only doesn't violate anyone's libertarian rights, but it will be to the advantage, everyone will, it will be to the advantage of people in that, with the dominant agency, to get into a minimal state. They'll find it in their interest to do so. Now, before I get to uh, Nozick's argument for that, I think there is a problem for the argument as I've so far presented it. Remember, what he's saying is that uh, because of the uh, this process where the larger the larger agency will uh, win out over smaller agencies. Once an agency gets significantly larger, there'll be a tendency for people to go to that agency till you get a dominant agency. So he's saying, un unlike the standard case, there's no uh, natural tendency toward monopoly on the free market. The size of a of a firm relative to other firms, how many firms are in the industry, just depends on particular economic conditions of the industry. There's no natural tendency to monopoly. And Nozick fully accepted that point about economics, but he thought with protection services, it's different because the eight, one agency's strength is another's weakness. So there, this, you have this, can ha this snowballing effect will take place. So what I think is the problem with this is his argument might work too well in this sense. Uh, if he's right, then not only will the people in one agency get to be dominant over the other, it would seem like people would, or almost all people would leave that agency and join the monopoly agency. His, for his argument to work, there have to be a significant number of people outside the dominant agency because, as you'll see, his argument depends on saying that the dominant agency can restrict the other agencies in certain ways, and then it has to compensate its clients by providing them with low-cost or free protection services. So if it, if it doesn't do that because everybody's in the dominant agency, then it isn't meeting the second criterion that Nozick has set out for the state because, say, everybody, or almost everybody joins a monopoly agency and they're paying for its services, they're not meeting the criterion Nozick has set up where the agency is providing low cost uh, or no charge uh, protection services for people who are at least some people in the society. So Nozick seems to have an he seems to have an arbitrary stopping point. He's saying, well, here's a reason people will get into the leave the, their protection agencies and get into the, not the, the dominant agency, but this process will stop at a certain point <coughs> that enables the rest of my argument to go through. And he doesn't say why there would be this stopping point. All right, but let's put this aside so we now have, if he's right, there's a dominant agency and various other agencies who are independent, who people are in those agencies, they're uh, prote protecting themselves. They, if they're in a dispute with the dominant agency, then they'll lose, but still they're operating. And possibly they're people who don't, independent people who don't, haven't joined any agency at all. Now, uh, Nozick, now we get to the, the difficult chapter, which is one on risk. Uh, Nozick points, says, what, what happens, let's imagine a situation where a client of a dominant agency uh, commits some uh, crime, or is charged with some crime, against the client of one of the non-dominant agencies. So the non-dominant agency uh, puts the uh, client of the dominant agency on trial 
and then imposes some punishment. So you might think, well, that isn't a problem because uh, if it turns out, let's say the client then goes to his dominant agency and they decide he's not guilty, then the dominant agency can simply say, the other agency should pay compensation to the client for uh, for putting him on trial and saying uh, uh, wrongly, in their view, holding that he, he was guilty. So why is there a particular problem here? What would, why would this lead to any difficulty for the independent agency? They might not like having to pay compensation, but they're still they're still in existence, they're still operating. Now, Nozick thinks, though, uh, supposing they, they in, there are certain kinds of penalty that they could impose, like, say, the death penalty or putting, pe putting people in prison for a long time. He said, if people would be, who would be, might uh, be on trial, they, would be they might be afraid if the, let's say, this non-dominant agency used what the first agency thought was risky decision procedure, procedures that they thought had an undue risk of imposing these bad penalties on them. This would make them afraid. People would say, oh, well, what if I'm arrested by this, uh, these a this agency? Then they might decide to put me on trial where, say, you only need six out of 12 jurors to, for a guilty verdict, and then I might be, they might uh, subject me to execution. So even if, uh, even if the, I, or I, I'd be really afraid of this, so that they're imposing this risky decision procedure on me. So you might say, well, couldn't you then sort of say if they impose such a procedure, then you say, well, the, uh, the dominant agencies can say, don't, you know, don't carry out the sentence till we have a chance to look at it. And then you can just, if it turns out we disagree, then you can just compensate our client for the getting him afraid. So you can still have compensation there. You don't have, you're, you're still paying. You can ha still have the, the non-dominant agency can still put its, use whatever procedures it wants, it just has to compensate uh, people that it's put under this risk if, they're, if they're, they're found not guilty by the dominant agency. So Nozick said, no, this won't work. And you, you see how he gets, he thinks of all sorts of complications because he said, if people know that an agency will impose risky decision procedures, then even people who were never arrested for any crime will be afraid because they'll be afraid that if they are arrested, they will be subject to the non-risky the decision procedure. So they'll be afraid and they will never be compensated because remember they're not arrested for anything so the agency hasn't done anything for to them. It's just the fear that if they were arrested and subject to these risky decision procedures, they would be uh, uh, get these bad penalties that makes them afraid. So there's uncompensated for fear here. And Nozick thinks as a result of this, the dominant agency can tell the other agencies, you can't impose risky decision procedures, procedures that we contend are risky on our clients. Now, suppose it does that, it says you can't impose these procedures because you'll be generating this kind of fear and we, uh, you, you're unable to compensate our clients for this because even if you found, find them guilty and, and we disagree and find them not guilty, you won't be compensating the ones the clients of our, our clients who were made afraid and who didn't do anything that you didn't put on trial and arrest. So they can tell the agencies you can't use risky decision procedures. But what, yet one more complication. 
when we're imagining these agencies use risky decision procedures, they're not doing anything that's in, intrinsically wrong. They're not violating rights because it isn't that they're using decision procedures that everybody realizes are wrong that, you, that would be unfair or inequitable to use. It isn't say, or they're saying, we're deciding whether clients are guilty by reading tea leaves. Uh, it say they just have a different view of what risky, uh, proper procedures are from that of the dominant agency. So the Nozick holds there, uh, if you, the agency prohibits them from using procedures, then it, these risky procedures is really putting the clients of that agency at a disadvantage because then they can't protect themselves in the way that they think best, in the way that they think is suitable. They think these procedures are all right, but they can't use them. But the, remember, the first agency can prohibit them because according to its own view of risky procedures, these procedures are too risky. But it has to recognize the clients of the non-dominant agency find these procedures acceptable. So no, they said, well, if it prohibits them, then it has to offer them, those people, the independents who are disadvantaged by not being able to protect themselves, it has to offer them compensation. And the compensation is that they get either low cost or no cost protection services from the dominant agency. Uh, so it's kind of an odd sort of compensation is that if instead of being able to uh, get protection from the agency you want, you receive protection from the agency you don't want. Now you do have the right to refuse but and say, well, I want to get, uh, say, compensation in money instead, but knows it thinks very few people will want to do that because then they won't be able to protect themselves in the way that they want. Uh, so Nozick thinks, well, if this is right, then what's going to happen? You'll have not only an agency that will be able to will be dominant in the sense that uh, other it's the almost uh, no agency can challenge it, but it is able to supervise the use of force by all the other agencies. These other agencies are still able to protect clients so long as they don't have disputes with the dominant agency. But this knows it says, well, any state should be willing to do this. Any state should be willing to let people settle disputes among themselves as they wish. And plus, not only is it supervising uh, the use of force, but it has to provide protection services for uh, those who it's disadvantaged by prohibiting them from using the risky decision procedures that that agency. So it's met, according to Nozick, these two criteria for the state. So we have then first the ultra-minimal state, you have the dominant agency, is prohibiting other agencies from uh, using risky decision procedures on its clients, and then it's required immediately morally to transform itself into the minimal state, the state that is providing the protection services at non-market prices are free, or free to the clients at disadvantage. So uh, according to Nozick then, it's uh, a minimal state. We've shown, we've drawn the rabbit out of the hat. We've shown how you get from libertarian anarchy to minimal state without violating any libertarian rights and in a way that shows how people operate uh, each step is people be acting in their interests. Uh, I, I don't find this derivation very plausible uh, because first of all uh, it knows it, it would first apply only to cases where there are very severe penalties, such as hanging or long in prison, or, or 
it's hard to think of anything other than death penalty which could apply because even if, say, you were sentenced to long imprisonment, you would know that your agency can review the case. Maybe you'd still be afraid because you think your agency, I mean, if your agency confirmed it by its own procedures, you really couldn't object much, although maybe you'd still be feeling the extra fear then. But it would apply then only to a few cases. You couldn't say, how could you say you could prohibit the non nominating agencies from acting in all sorts of other crimes so long as it doesn't apply have these penalties, and then couldn't it also always refuse to apply the risky decision procedures to clients of the dominant agencies? Why, uh, you know, why would the other agencies have to put so much emphasis on this, these particular decision procedures that's arousing the dominant agency to act? And then, is it very likely that most people will think they're going to be seized and arrested anyway. I mean, suppose there's some uh, agency, say, that uh, uses six-man juries, so you think if somebody's arrested for murder, you'll have not a, a, a chance, if, and you're innocent, you'll have a, more of a chance of being wrongly found guilty than you would with a normal 12-person unanimous jury. Is that going to make people really fearful given that most people or very few people were ever arrested for murder. It seems like he knows if he's just taken one very small possibility and somehow elevated it into something extraordinarily serious. It seems like uh, much ado about very little. Uh, also, uh, supposing he, he does get Supposing, though, his argument works, as I'm sure he would have granted his argument works, then what happens if, uh, say, you have, in addition to the dominant agency, suppose you have a second agency that's sort of the second most powerful. Couldn't it use the same sort of argument as Nozick has to prohibit clients of the third agency for imposing risky decision procedures on its client. So then if it did that, then it would be exercising state-like function. So it would be, seems odd to say, you could say there's a state in existence if the dominant agency isn't the only one who can prohibit other people from using risky decision procedures in the way knows it one. But now, uh, I want to turn to the second person uh, in my lecture, Murray Rothbard, who's the writer who's most influenced uh, my own thinking in politics, in political theory. Uh, this, uh, Murray Rothbard is uh, the one who I think is the, is the one who has the most plausible position of any of the uh, philosophers I, I mentioned. Uh, Rothbard lived from uh, 1926 to 1995. He, got his, he was a PhD in economic history from uh, Columbia University where he studied under Joseph Dorfman. Uh, and then uh, he, he had a, he worked uh, for the William Volcker Fund where he wrote uh, reviews and reports on an amazing variety of scholarly subjects. He had an extraordinary range of command of sources and books on all sorts of things, not only economics, but history, philosophy, uh, political science, anything you mention he knew a great deal about. And, uh, he uh, taught at uh, Brooklyn Polytechnic and then at the uh, University of Nevada, Las, Las Vegas, until his death in 1995. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I can't recommend any good secondary literature on Rothbard. Uh, uh, I want to talk in particular about Rothbard's main book on political theory, uh, The Ethics of Liberty, which was originally published in 1980. 1982, and it's since been reissued in 
edition by the Mises Institute, published by the Mises Institute, uh, or available through the Mises Institute, I should say. Uh, there, uh, in this book, there are an enormous number of insights. It would be easy to give uh, different lectures on various topics in books. I've just selected a few. Now, one that I want to start with is one point where I think Rothbard makes a decisive advance from Nozick. Nozick isn't really clear on this issue. I think he probably had the correct view, but Rothbard is the clearest on this, and his precursor in the people I've talked about before is really Immanuel Kant on, on this particular point. And the point is this. Uh, the, in the Lockean tradition that Nozick was in of how property uh, is acquired, individuals can acquire property by mixing their labor with land, they come to acquire it. Locke said that the earth is given to everyone in common, so everyone starts off with, you start off with common ownership, and then you ask, how do people go from common ownership to individual ownership? Now, in Rothbard's view, I don't claim he was the first to say this, but as I say, Kant has this also, and you can mention other writers, it's very clear in Rothbard's system that this is the case. You start off with property as being unowned. You say, no one has any claim to land until people do something to acquire it. Now, I say Nozick is a bit unclear on this. We have to distinguish the, what the situation that Rothbard is trying, unowned property from this situation. Suppose we say in the situation before people start acquiring pro uh, land, let's say you just have people or living on the earth, no one's appropriated any land yet. We could say, you could imagine this system, people are free to use whatever exists uh, as they like, but they can't prevent other people from using this also. I don't mean to imagine a Hobbesian state of affairs where you have the right to take what you want in a sense you're under no obligation not to, but anyone else is free to take it from you if he can. I imagine a situation where, say, if I, you, say I come, ac I'm come across some, uh, an oasis in the desert, I'm free to take water from it, but I can't stop, say I've had my water and I uh, walk away, I can't say, okay, this is my oasis now, so you can't use it. You're, I'm pro, pro, uh, in ordinary property, when, when you acquire property, you have the right to exclude others from the use of the property. That's the whole point of ownership. So I'm imagining, say, a system of common use where somebody else can't push you away while you're drinking water, but you can't stop them from also taking water. Uh, we could see this, say, a situation somewhat like this is uh, checking out books in a public library, say, you can use the books, but you can't prevent other people from using them also. Say, when you return them, then other people are free to take them out. You can't say, this is my book, you can use it only if I say so. so this is a very different system from one where you say, you start off, land is unknown, people are free to acquire it. Now, the reason I think Nozick doesn't say explicitly he's starting off with a common use rule, but he has, he spends a great deal of time on provisos to the Lockean labor mixture. He says, well, uh, you, maybe you should say, Besides being able to being able to acquire land by doing something to it, like mixing your labor, 
makes your labor under certain conditions, you also have to leave, make sure that no one is made worse off by your doing this. Now, this, these provisos make a great deal of sense if you start with the common use system, because then when you appropriate land, you're depriving people of something. You're saying those people no longer have a liberty, which they did before, namely abusing that when they wanted, provided nobody else was using. Now, even if you're not using some I item that you've appropriated, no one else can use it without your permission. So there's been a loss there. So it makes much more sense to talk about are there qualifications, are there provisos to add to initial appropriation if you favor that system. But on Rothbard's view, you say, there's, you start off, no one owns any land, so it makes more sense to say that you don't have to meet any provisos other than appropriate, you just have to appropriate the land because you're not depriving anyone of some liberty that he had before. It isn't that the, the person, the other person had he got there before you could have appropriated land, so he's, he's losing something there, but he isn't losing any liberty to use any unused object that he wants, even one that someone else had used first. So this, I think, is a decisive advantage of Rothbard over Nozick. Nozick is, is, I think, could get out, possibly, of saying that he favors the common use system. He could say, well, uh, it is, it is, the provisors are just because we can't specify fully what the correct principle of appropriation is, but it's very I'm rather hazy what he meant. So Rothbard, I think, Rothbard, I think is much clearer here. This, as I mentioned, Kant also had the same view. Kant said, we, have, we start with the surface of the earth and then people are free to appropriate parts of it, we have to do so in a way where their acts of appropriation are come possible, they can all be realized together, but in Kant's view, you don't have to, all you have to do to appropriate something is to come to possess it, you don't have to meet any provisos. Now, uh, if you take matters in Rothbard's if you take Rothbard's view of property, here I'm not just talking about this particular point, but his whole view of property, then I think you can see that the problem of distribution, as Rawls has put it, really doesn't arise at all. Because Rawls is, is saying, uh, well, we're starting off with a group of people in a society, and we're asking, how should we distribute all the land, say all the territory that this is, the group is resident in, like we're imagining, say the people of the United States are all getting together and say, how should we distribute the land in the, the U.S.? What should be the rules governing pro the distribution of property? In Rothbard's system, there's no question of distribution in that sense at all. It, he starts all, I think you can see this in one of the very important chapters, I think the sixth chapter, called A Crusoe Social Philosophy. And he imagines a, a single person, Robinson Crusoe, who's on an island by himself. So he said, well, couldn't uh, Crusoe just uh, appropriate the island to his own use and build things, make grow food, uh, build tools, and clearly they would all be his. Now we could imagine people on different islands, uh, different Robinson Crusoe, they all have the same name of course, but they'd, uh, be, appropriate, they'd be appropriating land on their own areas, and we could imagine these people coming becoming aware of one another and then engaging in trade. They'd each be exchanging items that they made 
for others that they might like better. So Rothbard says, well, uh, could anybody object to that? We say each one is uh, legitimate, the owner of his island, his or her island, and then people are engaging in voluntary exchange. So isn't this perfectly all right? Uh, we, we couldn't have a Rawlsian come in and say, oh, you can't do that. You have to meet certain criteria of exchange. You have to uh, exchange uh, some islands might have more resources on them than others, so it's unfair that you're able to uh, benefit from more from this island than the other island. Uh, Rothbard says, isn't it quite clear that people could, would be the proprietors of their own island, could exchange freely the way they wanted? And I should say, uh, if you look at Rawls's book, A Law of Peoples, I didn't talk about that this morning in the lecture on Rawls, but Rawls himself says that people in different countries don't have to, you don't have to apply the difference principle between countries. He thinks it's all right for one country to have a higher standard of living than another. And he said, even if one country has more natural resources than another, he doesn't think this is grounds for redistribution. So here, he himself is rather Rothbardian. He just doesn't apply that within society. But now Rothbard says, well, supposing we imagine instead of having each person on a separate island, we have the people are all on the same territory and each one is uh, appropriated property. Why can't they do that? What's wrong with that? Why does the fact that they're all in the same territory mean that there's some special problem of distribution of a kind Rawls favors. So I think if you look at matters in this Rothbardian way, you can see that the whole way Rawlsian way of looking at, at distribution dissolves. There is no separate process of distribution at all. You just have individuals who legitimately acquired property, and then those individuals are free to trade or give gifts as they wish. That's all there is to it. Now, in uh, Ethics of Liberty, uh, Rothbard doesn't confine himself to uh, what happens in a libertarian, once we have a libertarian system, or problems of libertarian theory. He's also uh, concerned with another topic that we've discussed a great deal in these lectures, namely, uh, the nature of ethics. Uh, what, how do we know what is right, what's good? Uh, we've seen different theories such as uh, Aristotle's. We've had the uh, uh, Lockean theory, uh, uh, Hobbes' theory. We've seen various approaches. Uh, Rothbard was very much in the Aristotelian natural law tradition, very much like he was in Aristotle and St. Thomas were one writers he thought very highly of. Uh, now, uh, he, uh, he thought, though, that there had been an uh, uh, important modification in correct natural law views as applied to political philosophy, beginning with Locke and beginning especially with Locke and other individualist philosophers that was better than, it was an improvement on Aristotle and Aquinas. I remember in the lecture on Aristotle, I mentioned there was a problem in that Aristotle first uh, discusses how each person can lead a good life that each person has a nature and our purpose is to realize our nature, namely reason full, fully exercising itself. So he gets, has a whole count of how we do that. But then he also starts talking about the polis, which is a, a, the complete community by which people live well. And sometimes he, sa he says that 
people are just parts of the polis. The polis is superior to people. Now, I suggested, uh, following Fred Miller, that there is a indi way of taking Aristotle in individual, more individualist way. He isn't saying that people are su completely subordinate to the polis. But on the other hand, he does have these passages that suggest that it's not completely individualist. It's, there's some sort of common good that's different from the goods of each particular individual. And as a result, the people in the polis are subject, even in his ideal city state, they're subject to quite a bit of, of, of central of control by the ruling authorities. Now, you as say there are ways possibly of getting around that through saying people have, as Robert Long is pointing out, by saying people have consented to get into the state, the city state in the first place, and that goes some way to answering the problem. But then, of course, remember there's the, there are the slaves by nature, and so you still have difficulties there. Then, similarly in Aquinas, you still ha you have the concept of the common good also that's different from. In that of the individuals, and there's also disputes in his theory on just what the relation is between the common good and the individual good. So Rothbard thought that it is, that it's important to eliminate the notion of the common good from natural law theory if you taking it, taking the common good to be something apart from the good of the individuals who are uh, in the society. So all you have in his version of natural law is each individual is trying to achieve the best life for him or herself and the, the uh, society in which they live where you have the competing protection agencies is simply a framework in which they can do this. It isn't, uh, there's no entity with a good of its own. Uh, in these lectures, I've had quite a few critical comments on the uh, Straussian political interpretations of various philosophers where they're all, they, he, they say they're all secret atheists. There isn't a Straussian view of Murray Rothbard, as far as I know, but I mentioned Strauss because here, for once, uh, there's a point at which Rothbard praises Strauss, and he, he thinks very highly of an argument that Strauss gives in Natural Right and History. Uh, the argument is this. Uh, one view that's opposed to the Aristotelian Thomistic natural law position that, that Rothbard favors is one that says ethics is completely subjective. Uh, people, ethical terms just express person's preferences. If I say something is good, either I, it's just equivalent to a statement that I like that thing, or I'm not stating I like it, but just I'm expressing a, a like for it. These are, of course, theories of the kind uh, held by logical positivists, you know, such as uh, A.J. Ayer and Charles Stevenson. They have theories. There is no truth in ethics, just people have different preferences. Now, one argument that Leo Strauss used against that view, the one that Rothbard accepted, is uh, there are terms that we use in ordinary language that are, have criteria, clear criteria for use, but nevertheless, using these terms involves some judgment of something being good or bad. Suppose, for example, that I say someone is a coward. Well, that uh, is a statement. It isn't just an expression of I'm not just uh, expressing some sort of liking or disliking that you can, I could do as I like. Just I say, I like orange juice. You can't really say, well, you're wrong about that. Just, well, I like orange juice. If you don't, 
you're not disagreeing with me, you just have a different preference. You don't like our Jews. Here, if I say someone's a coward, then you might say, uh, no, he isn't at all, and say uh, he wasn't really fleeing in battle. You misunderstood what was going on. If I was wrong, I couldn't just say, well, I just say he's a coward, that's all there is to it. There are criteria for the correct and incorrect use of the concept. Nevertheless, if I've said someone is a coward, I've certainly expressed this. I've said the person is, has a bad trait. So just using the term necessary imply it entails that I've also made a judgment of value. So there isn't in using this term, there isn't, as David Hume famously said, a split or dichotomy between the fact, namely the person, say, has fled in the face of the enemy, and the value judgment, I'm free to make the value judgment or not as I like it. The two are inextricably combined. Just saying, using the terms, is involves one in... Uh, value judgments as well. So on Strauss's view, which Rothbard accepted, then just using our ordinary language brings value judgments with it. So values are not, as this view says, purely subjective. Uh, Strauss uh, anticipated a famous argument, this very influential analytic philosophy, uh, that uh, Philip of Foot uh, used, and other writers uh, used this also, this exactly the same kind of argument. In, uh, uh, Ludwig von Mises didn't accept the argument. He replied to Strauss, and his reply anticipated the reply that uh, R.M. Hare, uh, remember I mentioned him in the, as uh, responding to Rawls, gave to uh, gave to Philip Foote. So the, the Strauss-Mises exchange anticipated this analytical philosophy exchange between Foote and Hare. Uh, I should say also, just uh, uh, passing, uh, I understand uh, Mises and Strauss really didn't like each other. Personally, they met at a conference on relativism where this issue was discussed and they didn't get along at all. I think Mises, uh, Murray Rothbard told me, uh, Mises remarked to Strauss, he said, uh, in, in Germany was nothing but a high school teacher. Uh, so uh, Rothbard then, as I say, defended a natural law view and uh, he thought this, arg this was one argument that could be a very good argument to refute ethical subjectivism. Uh, he also, uh, in defending natural law view, he disagreed with the views of his own great teacher in economics, Ludwig von Mises. He, Mises thought one could get around the whole problem of nature of ethics and still defend the free market. And the way Mises did this, he said, well, uh, he, we can show that uh, interferences with the free market will fail from the point of view of the ones who want to interfere with the market themselves. So we don't have to make, have any appeal to natural law. Mises didn't accept natural law. We don't have to appeal to any controversial value judgment. We just say to the, say, the person, say, well, you want to achieve certain goals and the measures you propose won't get you where you want. Remember, just like one of the hypothetical imperative that I was talking about in the Kant lecture, uh, if you want this, you should do that. So Mises say, you won't get what you want by doing what you're saying. So it's just, uh, it's not making value judgment to say that you shouldn't be a socialist or interventionist if Mises is right. You're just, it's just sort of an imperative of ration. There's a sort of a principle no one could rationally refuse that you should adopt suitable means to the ends you want. Then uh, 
that's all that's needed, according to Mises, to argue for the free market. For example, uh, suppose the government says uh, there isn't enough cheap housing available for poor people, so the government passes a rent control law. Uh, that's an example, incidentally, that ha there's an uh, interesting story that I'm not going to go into now that involves Nozick in connection with rent control, but I'll, I'll pass up the opportunity to mention, to discuss that. Maybe anyone's interested in the question period, I can talk about it. Uh, so, so the government says, we want, we don't want to have, uh, uh, we want to have more housing available to poor people, so we have rent control. But what's going to happen once you have rent control, then landlords won't be very anxious to put rental property on the market, or they'll withdraw a part. They won't keep apartments in rep good repair. They'll tend to withdraw uh, apartments from the market. So the result will be that there are fewer apartments available both for the poor, so you won't be getting what the, the people who favor rent control won't be getting what they want. Mises goes on to argue, well, then there they can try to cope with that by more intervention, and then that will fail also, so they'll either have to, they could stay where they are if they want, but then they just be in a situation where they're not getting what they want, so they can either try to have more, even more intervention, it'll fail, or they'll have to go back to the free market. Then also he argues, well, if they try to apply, just socialize everything, then his famous calculation argument shows that can't possibly work. They won't be able to have a developed economy pr with, uh, producing a wide variety of goods <laughs> under socialism, so that won't work. So Mises said, look, you don't have to have any special natural law arguments or any other kind of special arguments uh, to defend capitalism, you can just use these value-free arguments to say these measures won't get you what you want. Now, uh, Rothbard doesn't reject these arguments, quite the contrary, he thinks there's a great deal to them. He certainly thinks Mises is right that interventionism fails or that socialism won't work. He himself has given the same points uh, in his own books, but he says it isn't sufficient using these arguments doesn't suffice to uh, defend the market. Uh, it won't get rid of every all the opponents because, a, say, someone, let's say, uh, someone favors rent control, he could say, well, what I'm aiming for is just cheap apartments for a particular group of people, and I'll make sure by the legislation that they get access to the low-cost apartments. So I don't care if other people aren't able to get apartments at the low rent, or if those people, uh, as a result of the measures I want, other people are, are, are more people can't get apartments than before. I don't care about the effects of other people as long as the ones I want get something. So if somebody took that view, then Mises' argument wouldn't work against them because they wouldn't have the goal that uh, Mises is attributing to me. Mises is certainly right that certain goals can't be achieved by intervention, but he hasn't shown that all interventionists have to have those particular goals. They might have other goals that can be achieved. So we can't, although Mises' arguments are extremely important, part of the case for the free market, they don't do the full job. I just want to conclude with uh, one other, I think, very good, uh, excellent uh, insight in the book that uh, Rothbard has where he discusses the unanimity criterion. Uh, you remember I mentioned this briefly this morning where it was a case where uh, I said where, where Rawls would 
seem to be, have to oppose a situation where everybody is better off by a certain distribution of wealth and no one worse off because he would have to say some distribution where some people were poorer is closer to the difference principle than one where say these this other people or these other people are better off because it's closer to equality so Rothbard doesn't reject the unanimity criteria he doesn't in this sense he doesn't say well suppose some change makes some people better off doesn't make any anyone worse off and we say how is this established say, suppose everybody approves the change then uh, it's all right he doesn't say no that's wrong even if some everybody approves a certain change we shouldn't do it but he says this is not you can't use this as as the basis of a correct or a, full, a real a full political ethics he thinks that uh, James Buchanan not the president before Lincoln but the famous economist is uh, guilty of this point Buchanan and his colleague uh, Gordon Tullock try to justify measures by using the unanimity criteria and then they say well since you can't have unanimity then they try to say well you have practical unanimity come close to that uh, so you come as close as you can to that and that's really a key part of their whole system so Rothbard said well what's the big problem with doing social philosophy uh, in this way relying on the unanimity criteria it privileges the status quo the existing state of affairs I mean supposing let's say you start off with a system of slavery some people are uh, slaves of others and you could say well uh, should we free the slaves uh, you couldn't do so on the grounds of the unanimity criteria because the owners wouldn't be made better off they wouldn't like the change so freeing slaves doesn't meet the unanimity criteria if you could cut uh, but certainly we would say you should do it the, the, people, the slaves are being deprived of their natural rights so Rothbard said you can't as you can and other people who favor uh, modern welfare economics do away with natural rights you need this for a uh, correct uh, political ethics and in this I think he was entirely right so I think I'll now uh, end in any questions uh, uh, yes does either Nozick or Rothbard talk about the effects of external security threats from other societies or states on the anarcho-capitalist system um, in terms of the development of the defense? Because uh, it would seem that uh, external threats necessitate not only private defense firms, um, but a unified military force to sufficiently deter aggressors. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, the question was, uh, do either Nozick or Rothbard talk about how an individual anarchist society would respond to external threats and it was suggested that in response to such threats uh, a, a society would need a unified form of defense that an uh, individualist anarchist system wouldn't work well uh, so far as I know uh, Nozick didn't write on foreign policy issues he did have views about foreign policy I think uh, he probably would have agreed with you on the point he didn't Rothbard uh, did write on foreign policy uh, defense issues he didn't agree with you he claimed that the free market uh, system private protection agencies could adequately defend uh, against uh, other agencies against external threats I think if you want to pursue this further there are two very good anthologies one's edited by Hans Hoppe and another by Ed Stringham that uh, in which this issue is very much discussed but uh, the, you, the the details on how there how 
individualist anarchist system would do this. I don't think I can go into now. But in general, I would say, uh, if you say, if we think in general, the market is more efficient than government in, the government in providing services, it's not clear why defense should be an exception. Uh, if you need some kind of unification, as you suggest, to defend against, say, some massive external threat, uh, what would prevent the relevant agencies from agree making agreements to unify, have a unified defense measure? It's not an area that's uh, something, I, defense policy is not something I specialize in, so I can't give you any more detailed answer. Uh, Matthew? question was, uh, I describe in the, my talk how Nozick uh, discusses competing private protection agencies. In, is this at all like the situation, say, in the Cold War where you had competing blocks of nation? Some, say, one would claim to represent freedom and there would be opposition of different bureaucracies. And, uh, it was suggested this is a I think right this was not a very desirable state of affairs. Well, you remember both in Nozick and in Rothbard, uh, it's, it's, we're starting up, we're assuming everybody accepts uh, basically libertarian law code. It isn't, you don't have competing agencies in the sense, say, that some su support libertarian rights and there are others who say are totalitarian or who, who uh, have completely different views of rights, uh, you do have a problem. What if you had such an agency, that would be considered an outlaw agency, and then there's some question how to deal with that. But in the system that Nozick is setting up, you're not, you wouldn't have such a phenomenon. That's not the way you set up the hypothesis. You do have, and this he goes into in part three of Energy State Utopia on Utopia, you do have, uh, people who have communities with different conceptions of life, they're within the framework of a minimal state. You would have separate communities where people would each be pursuing different views of the good life, but none of these would be uh, violating anyone's rights or acting as these bureaucratic blocks that you call attention to. Uh, uh, Dan? Um, you mentioned uh, Rothbard's Aristotelian essentialism as mm -hmm. uh, like a method for performing uh, natural law theory in the face of liberty. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if um, you think his chapter on proportional punishment is consistent with that method, or if he changes gears to go to more um, you know, deontological justifications for, for the, the punishment as a response to property rights. Uh, the question was, I, I talked about uh, Rothbard's Aristotelian essentialism, and is this, uh, is this view consistent with what Rothbard says 
in his chapter on proportional punishment that perhaps the view there is one more, uh, more de ontological theory that rather than stress what the natural tendencies would be, there he's relying on other considerations. Uh, well, it's certainly true that Rothbard's views in that chapter are different from Aristotle's. Remember, Aristotle's view was corrective just, uh, justice was you restore the situation to the as best you can to what it was before the crime was committed. And in fact, Fred Miller, when he uh, discusses this, has a footnote citing saying Randy Barnett had a similar view. You know, Randy Barnett's view, you don't have anything beyond making the person who's committed the crime give back what he's given. But whether you could, this means that you couldn't have an Aristotelian theory on the way Roth, uh, basis for Rothbard's views, I don't know. Uh, you see, when you talk about natural tendencies in the Aristotelian sense, you're not talking about what it's likely people are going to do. You would be saying what is in a, what be, what best develop what is most in accord with reason exercise to its fullest. And then to make your point, you would have to show that this is incompatible with the dessert-based view that Rothbard has, or maybe he would have to show that it's compatible with the Aristotelian view. He doesn't really give any, try to derive the view from uh, any view, Aristotelian view of essences. He just, he does discuss it independently, but I think that leaves the question open. Well, I see we're out of time, and I finish now, and I want to Thank all of you. You've been very kind to come to my lecture. Thanks very much. On behalf of Lou Rockwell, the Mises Institute, I want to thank you for being here this week. I want to thank our audience who's visited us uh, on the web. Uh, these lectures will be archived on the media archives of uh, Mises.org. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Steve Berger and Ken Garcina for sponsoring this event and uh, our production crew and staff for taking good, such good care of us this week, and most especially to Dr. David Gordon uh, to thank him and to congratulate him on his work here this week. Thank you.